Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, I, my name is Mohit Daga, and uh, I'm going to be help, help to facilitate this track. Good evening to all, and thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in this summit and to present to you on the importance of governance tools to underpin a medicine master data system. My name is Shireen Govinder. I'm a pharmaceutical policy specialist and will be representing the team at the Affordable Medicines Directorate of the National Department of Health. In the presentation, I will set the scene on the current public healthcare system and introduce to you the standard treatment guidelines and formularies. The challenges we faced will then be addressed and I will take you through the journey we had traveled to find the solutions. South Africa is at the center of the global AIDS epidemic and has one of the highest burdens of tuberculosis in the world. An efficient and effective health supply chain that improves medicine availability is critical to address that disease burden. So to put this in perspective, we have a population of 59 million people. 78% are dependent on the public healthcare system. 7.5 million people are living with HIV, and we have a healthcare budget of 229 billion for the help for the period of 2020-2021. So South Africa's unique disease burden shapes the country's national health priorities, health system design, and health funding structures. There are limited funds, which has to be allocated according to an evidence-based approach in order to provide the best quality health care for all of our people. The Affordable Medicines Directorate provides strategic leadership, a supportive legislative and policy environment, as well as ongoing monitoring relating to medicine access via our National Surveillance Center. Within Affordable Medicines are a team of passionate people that deal with the contracting of medicines, supply chain, contract management, and we have the Essential Drugs Program that deals with medicine selection and use. The Essential Drugs Program oversees the development and implementation of the Standard Treatment Guidelines, the STGs, and the Essential Medicines List, the EML, through a committee of clinical experts called the National Essential Medicines List Committee. So this is quite an important diagram that serves to clarify how the National Department of Health works with the provinces and how the dissemination of information occurs. We have the National Medicines List Committee, which develops the EML, and it serves to satisfy the priority healthcare needs of majority of the, of the country. It takes into consideration new therapeutic needs and promotes equity as well. The STG, however, is an implementation mechanism of the EML in the form of guidelines that are applicable at various levels of care. Each province then takes the EML and tailor makes a formulary. So the provincial formulary is derived from the EML, but satisfies that priority health care needs of that specific population in that specific province. This review of the formulary occurs through a body called the Pharmaceutical and Therapeutics Committee. These formularies are then disseminated from provinces down to other healthcare facilities to be further adapted to their needs according to their population. So given the background, it alludes to some of the challenges we are facing. The current medicine management systems were existing in isolation with data and functionality often being duplicated across systems. There was a lack of integration of the data. Reporting and analyzing data across the medicine value chain was quite difficult due to different naming conventions and a lack of standardization. So there were policy principle challenges and very importantly, a lack of reliable, easily accessible data, especially when needed. So to kickstart the process, to address the need for a more predictable supply chain, a medicine master data system needed to be developed. 
policies and guidelines, and the governance structure underpinning this at the foundation was needed by the National Department of Health, and then for implementation at both the provincial and at a district level. The MMDS will be the master data set to form the basis of other electronic systems being developed for the public healthcare system. Example, we have electronic uh, dispensing and prescribing, there's inventory management and a reporting system. And so begins this exciting journey where we could see so much potential for benefit when we reach that final destination. The Affordable Medicines Directorate then identified various governance documents that required development in order to form the MMDS. Governance documents were developed to define the principles on which rational selection, management and use of medicines should take place, as well as to inform the basis on which medicine management systems should be built. Initial scoping documents were developed, documents were circulated to key internal and external stakeholders to help ensure that the guidelines address the stakeholder needs and thus support effective implementation. Drafts of the documents were developed following literature review, brainstorming, alignment with existing policies and international best practice. Once drafts had been prepared, rigorous stakeholder consultation involving invitations for comment, presentations, and one-on-one -on -one feedback sessions also took place. Governance documents were refined and signed off by the relevant level within the National Department of Health Documents were communicated to all relevant stakeholders for implementation, and then there was a period of reflection and revision whenever needed. So this slide provides a timeline of when these documents were published. In January of 2015, the National PTC policy was published. And as we mentioned, one of the key functions of the PTC is to manage the formulary. And this policy provided standards for establishing this non-statutory multidisciplinary advisory committee. In April of 2019, the National Formulary Guideline was published, and this document defined the concept of a formulary and provided guidance on the development, the management, and the use of formularies at all levels of care. So also in April of 2019, the MMDS policy was published and this document defined the concept of MMDS within the public sector and provided guidance on its, on its development, its management and its use. And then in December of 2019, we had the PTC guideline being published. Now there are definitely stronger and weaker PTCs within the country. And so this document provides tools to capacitate them to increase their functionality. So all of these documents enable the national, provincial and district levels to be aligned with respect to how medicine data would be managed. Filtering of these documents down to be effectively implemented was definitely an integral part of our journey. So within the medicine master data system, there are various components that are built into it. We have the repositories, uh, which are preset master data lists. And these include the INN, the dosage form, the route of administration, etc. We then have the medicine master tool, which allows us to build medicines into the system using these preset static repositories. We then have the master health product list, which is a complete list of all medicines procured within the public sector. We have the contract master tool, which we are currently developing and allows for the management of medicines procured via a national contract. And then we have the formulary management tool, and this allows provinces and facilities to build their formularies into the system, which provides visibility of these medicine lists, not only to prescribers within their own institutions, but to prescribers in other facilities as well. And this will be greatly beneficial when patient referrals take place. So the impacts and the outcomes. Firstly, there was an integration of medicine selection, 
tenders, supply chain and use. There was an alignment of the provincial formularies and this will lead to better procurement as we are aware of exactly what meds are being used and the trends for such use. So going forward, we will then be able to perform medicine utilization evaluations to also better inform the supply chain. Another bonus that we are currently working on is the accessibility of these formularies to prescribers at the point of care via their mobile handheld devices. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, it gave us an opportunity to test the system and having these processes in place made it a lot easier to incorporate certain key medicines into the formularies of healthcare establishments as they were being approved for the treatment of COVID-19. So some of the key learnings was that electronic systems based on strong governance are key drivers of improved access to medicines. Stakeholder consultation is also key to ensure acceptability and effectiveness of a policy intervention. Documenting and gaining support and agreement on the policy principles underpinning the Medicine Master Data System was found to be a fundamental input to successful design, development, and the introduction of the system. Going forward, we can assess the use of medicines on the ground much easier. And this has a direct impact on the demand forecasting and the supply and procurement of medicines. To drive change in the supply chain, we have to work towards medicines being used rationally according to the standard treatment guidelines. Otherwise, no amount of demand forecasting and modeling will help us predict what medicine is needed and how much of it. And so we found that the medicine management team, it's important not to forget about the beginning of the chain, which is medicine selection, and the end of that chain, which is rational medicine use. So our journey as a country is far from over. We still have a long and winding road ahead of us, but we can already see that we are definitely on the right track. So all of these interventions were ultimately aimed at ensuring that the right dose of the right medicine is given to the right patient at the right time and promote sustained improvement in clinical, in, in clinical uh, outputs. So these are the lessons learned and the structures for medicines. But going forward, we need to incorporate other health technologies under the National Health Insurance. The question then begs, should they be managed in the same way? Thank you. Alrighty, and with that, that concludes the presentation. So now we're open for uh, Q&A. From Barbara, um, what was the uh, involvement of the private sector in the development? Uh, hi, Mohit. Hi, Barbara. So uh, this was actually uh, developed for the public sector. So um, it hasn't been, we haven't involved the private sector as yet, but this is a model that we uh, will be taking into um, the national health insurance going forward. So, but that would uh, require more engagement at a, later, at, a, at a later date. Wonderful. Susan, go ahead. You can um, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. If you could comment on the importance of getting the policy principles down and accepted by stakeholders prior to the development of the, of the IT system. Because my yes. experience is that often people are inclined to throw a, an IT solution at a problem uh, without having thought through the principles underlying that system. Thanks, Susan. That, that's actually a very good question. Um, we found that that was actually quite important because it laid the foundation um, for what needed to be done. Um, and, you know, in South Africa, we have nine provinces. So the, the policies and the guidelines were actually quite important to um, inform people of, of what the whole strategy was about and to inform them of what was needed. Um, and, and to develop that first meant that um, they were involved, they, they were, um, you know, these stakeholders provided input 
uh, in the policies and guidelines, and, and we're fully au fait with what was going to uh, come down to the provinces. So, so having their involvement and, and, you know, and their engagement before the IT system came um, actually improved um, you know, uh, the adoption of that IT system as well. Janine, I see your hand is raised, so go, go ahead. Uh, thanks. Also, just in, in response to uh, Susan's question as well, um, I'm also part of the team. Um, I think, um, as Shireen has indicated that, or as Sue has also indicated, is that it's fine and well having the system, but um, at the end of the day, the system has to be implemented. So you have to have a solid foundation, and we believe that the governance around um, the system development and implementation is important, and hence the policy. So the policy will provide the framework from end to end in terms of the users, the objective um, of, of, the, of the system, uh, the end outcome, because at the end of the day, um, it will be the true north, so to speak. So we always go back to um, the policy and the governance to make sure that that is in place as a solid foundation in order to implement whatever system. And of course, with policy development, as Shavina outlined, that will include stakeholder engagement before we even consider developing anything. Um, and that's what we found um, in our experience in, in South Africa. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Janine. Um, Khadija, I, I remember seeing your hand was raised. Do you, have a, do you wanna unmute yourself and go ahead and ask the question, is that your question? Okay. Um, no, it wasn't a question. It's more uh, in response to the question that was asked. I'm also part of the team. Um, you know, I think system developments uh, have taken a different, um, uh, you know, path these days. So oftentimes it starts with a, with a vision and a strategy about, you know, what you want to do. And as soon as you start developing systems, you do realize the potential that it holds to do many more things than what, than what you originally intended. And although you would want the governance and, and uh, the policies to be uh, developed and, and well thought through, it should also be um, you know, flexible to accommodate the new thinking. Um, so oftentimes you will find with something, especially when it's new, uh, it's not done before, et cetera, um, it kind of becomes quite um, organic in terms of the possibilities that, you, that, that, um, that, that's, uh, that it holds for, for implementation, integration with other systems, et cetera. Um, and just to say that this, um, the team has done a, a, a tremendous amount of work on it. And although we didn't have a lot of private sector um, engagement on it, there has been a lot of private sector learnings and um, engagement on it. Uh, not the engagement, but like thinking on it. Um, the private sector in South Africa themselves doesn't have a master data set. So as government, we leading the charge in terms of what master data should be looking like, um, what are the relevant fields, what are the utilities for something like this. Um, so yeah, so I think as far as that is concerned, um, although we, we, we may think that private sector is ahead of the pack in this instance, I would, I would say we are ahead of them. All right, wonderful. Um, with that, we will actually move on to our second presentation. Um, they've also sent me their, um, an audio file of their, of their presentation, so I will play that and then we can open up to more questions. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Barbara Lamphere. I'm a senior technical advisor with JSI. I will be making this presentation today along with my colleague, Omar Balsara. We are pleased to present our supply chain strengthening work in Indonesia. Through the My Choice project, JSI has supported Indonesia's National Population and Family Planning Board, known as BKKBN, in their effort to digitize and transform the family planning supply chain. JSI has partnered with BKKBN to develop a suite of applications. In this presentation, we will describe the application development process, its features and benefits, as well as share a few implementation results. Let's begin with an overview of the family planning supply chain in Indonesia. Indonesia is one of the largest family planning programs in the world. To support this program, BKKBN has a large network of warehouses and service delivery points. As you can see from this pipeline diagram, each level is managed by different actors. It makes this system extremely complex as it requires strong communication and coordination across a number of different agencies and providers. To add to the complexity, 
Within each level, there are multiple divisions that are responsible for supply chain functions. These divisions often work in silos, which cause inefficiencies in supply chain operations. Through the My Choice project, JSI has been collaborating with BKKBN since 2015 to strengthen Indonesia's family planning supply chain system. During phase one, from 2015 to 2018, the project worked in 11 districts to build supply chain capacity. It was observed that warehouse management practices were not optimal. This led to phase two of the project that began in 2018, which is the focus of our presentation today. In this phase, we are collaborating with BKKBN to develop and roll out a mobile application for warehouse management and a web-based application for distribution planning and monitoring. In July of 2018, we began product design and development with the assistance of a local software company in Indonesia and also added a software manager to our team. Following exhaustive testing, in May 2019, we began the pilot implementation in one province warehouse and 24 district warehouses. The pilot was well received and after incorporating user feedback and adding additional features, the product was rolled out to additional districts in 2019. By the end of 2019, BKKBN decided to integrate the tools into their policies and roll out the products nationwide. This scale up is currently in progress with all provinces and districts expected to be on board by 2021. Currently, we are building BKKBN's capacity to administer and maintain the products to ensure a smooth transition. So why does BKKBN need to digitize its supply chain system? Many of these needs were identified during the first phase of the project where we worked with province and district stakeholders to collectively identify bottlenecks and areas in inefficiencies. These needs can be categorized into four groups. First, BKKBN needed a system that could support the large family planning distribution network. Initially, we worked in only 11 districts. We deployed simple Excel-based tools that worked very well and served the purpose at the time. However, we realized that this model could not be sustained at scale and there was a need for a comprehensive digital system that could integrate and standardize supply chain operations across levels and regions. Data management at warehouses was not very efficient. Poor record keeping procedures and duplicative documentation requirements put a burden on warehouse managers, taking their attention away from other important tasks such as distribution and monitoring. This created a need to streamline processes as well as update some of the policies. Poor record keeping practices also created data quality issues and as a result, higher level managers never trusted the data being reported. In the first phase, the project laid a strong emphasis on data use and there was a need to have good quality data on which to base decisions. A digital ecosystem could strengthen the quality of the data as well as provide real-time visibility. Finally, many supply chain tasks were still done manually, which negatively impacted the previously discussed areas of data quality, efficiency, and scalability. There was a strong need to increase automation and update the skills of workers. Once the needs were identified, we came up with a framework of objectives that would inform the product design. The first objective, which was extremely important to government, was to standardize operations and strengthen compliance of policies across levels of the supply chain. Next, because of Indonesia's decentralized structure, it was important for the system to have end-to-end -end integration and communication across levels. The third objective was to automate and digitize documentation across all supply chain functions to reduce workload and increase efficiency. To ensure data is used and acted upon, we wanted to build a system that minimizes quality issues and eliminates duplication. Next, we wanted to leverage digitization by enabling real-time data visibility and use to increase responsiveness and make the system more dynamic and resilient. Our last objective, and one of the most important, is we wanted to design a product that was simple and easy to adopt by users and easy to administer and maintain by the government. 
Now Omar will tell us about tool development and functionality. Thank you, Barbara. The system comprises two tools that are used to support multiple supply chain tasks. Stocku, which means my stock in Indonesian, is an Android-based application used by warehouse staff to manage its operations. Stocku is currently being used at province and district warehouses and will soon be deployed to the central warehouse and health centers. Stocku is complemented by Sirica, which is an acronym that translates to Supply Chain Information Systems for Family Planning Commodities. Sirica is a web-based application used by program staff for distribution planning and monitoring key performance indicators. This tool also links to BKKBN's facility information system. Both these tools are interconnected and are hosted in the cloud. This presentation will focus mainly on Stocku. Let's take a look at some of the features of the Stocku mobile app. Stocku is an Android-based app available for download on the Google Play Store. The app is in Indonesian and is used exclusively by the family planning program. Here you can see a screenshot of the homepage. On the top is a transactions menu where the user can create receipts and issues. The second row includes stock records and a menu for the user to do a physical count. The last row includes stock reports that are automatically generated. I am going to walk you through a few of these menus to give an idea of how the warehouse manager uses the app. The first menu is for receipts. The user will get an advance notification that the goods have been shipped from the higher level. And as in when the goods are received, using a single click, they can confirm the products and quantities received. Once confirmed, all details are automatically entered into the stock records. The next menu is for issuing products. The program manager creates orders in the web-based system, which are then automatically sent to Stocku. When the warehouse manager is ready to begin the issue process, the system will automatically select the batch numbers based on first expiry first out. Once approved, the delivery documents are automatically generated. The drill down view shows individual shipments and the current status of each shipment. Viewing and printing of delivery documents is also available as needed. Stock records are automatically generated based on the transactions entered. Additionally, losses and adjustments can be logged and tracked. For example, let's click on the stock card menu and view the stock card for IUD. It gives you a quick view of the current balance and historical transactions for this product. Time periods can be customized and the stock card can be printed with a single click. Lastly, the app automatically generates reports in specific formats as per the policies. Here is an example of a monthly summary report for multiple products, which is used by higher levels for monitoring. As noted earlier, one of the system objectives is to improve communication and coordination across levels. The user can enable push notifications to receive alerts based on the preferences set. It could be when stocks are low or out of stock, are close to expiry, or for certain delivery status notifications. As described earlier in the digital architecture, the Stocku mobile app works in combination with the web-based Sirica app. While we do not have time today to present the details on this web-based tool, I would like to briefly talk about how data generated from Stocku is used in this tool. First and foremost, this tool helps users develop distribution orders by calculating resupply quantities using data from Stocku. Once the distribution order is created, it is automatically sent to Stocku for further processing. The Sirica tool also provides real-time visibility on status of delivery orders and shipments. This is particularly useful to program managers who do not have access to the Stocku app. It is also used for monitoring and supervision by higher level managers. 
Documents such as distribution orders and delivery notes are available in the Sirica tool for viewing and printing. This is useful for warehouse managers who have printer connectivity to their desktops and not their mobile phones. Lastly, the tool provides a dashboard providing real-time data on key performance indicators. Managers also have the ability to view warehouse records such as stock cards if needed. Overall, this tool provides great visibility into supply chain operations across the different levels and is appreciated by higher level managers for monitoring. Moving on, let's have a look at some results on the implementation and the impact these tools have had on supply chain operations. Rolling out a new application across a network as large as Indonesia's is no small task. As can be seen in this chart, the initial implementation began in June 2019 in one province comprising 24 districts. Over the course of the next year, it was gradually expanded to districts in three other provinces. During this initial period, the development team worked on product improvements based on user feedback and strengthened the system to be ready for scale. Due to COVID-19, we lost a few months and there had to be a change in strategy. We built e-learning modules that could be used for self-learning as well as through live virtual sessions. In June 2020, a team of master trainers was trained. This was followed by training in all 34 provinces. Currently, district level trainings are taking place and to date, 246 districts have been trained. In usual times, a monitoring team would travel to the field to follow up post-training. However, due to COVID restrictions still in place, the monitoring is currently being done virtually. Monitoring is key to ensuring quick adoption and we have observed that most provinces and districts have begun implementing within two months of receiving the training. We also looked at supply chain performance over the last year in districts that have been using the system and have observed improved availability of contraceptives. Stockout rates have decreased by 14% on average, while the percent of SDPs or service delivery points that maintain adequate stock levels has increased by 12%. Here are a few qualitative results based on testimonials from users. Users value the automation these tools have introduced and appreciate the reduction in workload. Standardization and compliance of policies have been improved and BKKBN has appreciated the roles have played in enforcing the new updated policies. As the record keeping burden has reduced, managers and staff are able to spend more time on other important tasks such as monitoring. As users have started using the dashboard, they have appreciated the visibility of real-time data and have a better understanding of why data quality is so important. Lastly, communication and coordination has improved, resulting in increased accountability and ownership. Overall, the results have shown that several objectives that we set out to achieve have been met, and it will be important for users to get into the habit of using the new systems. While we have had a lot of success in a short time, there have been a few challenges along the way as well. The first one is product bugs due to the continued development of the tools. We have tried to address bug fixing by scheduling the maintenance during a date when managers are not usually preparing for distribution. We have also tried to improve communication with the developer team as well as coordinate more with the users. The second one is the project doesn't provide infrastructure. This, that means that users should use their own existing phones and computers to access the tools. Basically, they have to use their own phone. The last challenge is the need to continuously support and motivate staff to use the system in a timely manner. As mentioned earlier, due to COVID, the team has had limited opportunity to monitor implementation. Most support has been done through WhatsApp. We have encouraged BKKBN province staff to complement the digitization with other interventions such as supportive supervision and quality improvement team meetings to get the most benefit for the program. To wrap up our presentation today, we would like to share some next steps the team is working on. On the training side, we will continue supporting BKKBN to roll out the products to all regions in Indonesia. We have plans to develop a Staku app for the health center level and central warehouse, and to continue to build e-learning modules to support the rollout. Once completed, 
BKKBM will be able to achieve end-to-end -end connectivity of its supply chain. We are also looking at other features such as developing a desktop version and offline capability. Lastly, as we near the end of the project, we are focusing on building the capacity of BKKBN to administer and maintain the products going forward. Thank you very much for your time today. If you would like to learn more about our work in Indonesia, you can visit this link. We would be happy to take any questions. All righty, so we are now open to questions. Um, Barbara, if you had anything else you wanted to add on the presentation or anything that you wanted to share after that, but you are more than welcome to, and then we're open to questions. Um, and I think Omar is also here, so I ask him to also be here. <laughs> oh yeah, Omar as well, sorry. <laughs> Omar. Thanks. Um, uh, I, d I don't have anything in particular to add at, at this point. Um, I do wanna say that, you know, this process, uh, sort of related to, to a point that was made in the previous presentation. We did spend a, a, a good amount of time in the first phase of the project, really developing the skills in um, basic reporting and um, using, um, using paper-based uh, stock cards and building those skills and the knowledge in, in sort of the, the basics of logistics before it, moving to then Excel tools and then now into these digital tools. So it, it has been a, a process and a journey which BKKB and has been in the province and district staff have been involved in ever since the, the beginning. So um, so I think the it was a logical transition. Omar, do you have anything you want to add about the presentation? Uh, yeah, just to echo uh, what you said, Barbara, that uh, you know it was a gradual, long process of getting the buy-in of stakeholders at all levels. And uh, you know that's how we reached the stage where it was integrated into policies. Um, and we have been working side by side with the government on uh, you know updating all their policies as well to make sure it's aligned with uh, you know these new uh, systems. Thank you. Wonderful. I see Khadija, you have your hand raised. Um, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and then continue on. Um, thank you. This is a very nice presentation. It's very impressive. Um, I have two um, questions. Um, so how many facilities has it been rolled out to? So in terms of the number, may have been in the presentation. I'm sorry, I may have blinked and missed that. And then just uh, in terms of the uptake, what is the compliance in terms of the usage of the system at the facilities? Um, if you have any data about that, uh, it would be interesting to know. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you, Khadija, for your question. Um, so currently, the the app is being used at the warehouses, which is the province and district, and not at the health facility level. Uh, that is still under development, and we're going to be rolling that out early next year. Um, so in terms of warehouses, it's being used at currently 34 provinces and about 250 uh, district warehouses. Um, and that's something which will keep increasing as, uh, you know, additional warehouses get um, trained. Uh, there are about 500 uh, district warehouses in total in the country. Uh, so we're about halfway there right now. Um, and in terms of adoption, uh, you know, we mentioned in the presentation that uh, within about two months of the training, we've seen that, uh, you know, the, the warehouses have started using it on a routine uh, basis. Um, so, uh, you know, monitoring and uh, post training helps to make sure that, you know, the users learn the system and uh, start using it. Is there a second part to that question? Um, I have a follow up question, if I may, Mohit. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Was there any change management actively implemented as part of this rollout? Um, and the reason I ask is because we have a similar situation in our country and we just want to understand, you know, if, if um, you know, you have similar experiences um, that we have. In terms of a change management process, I would say that, you know, it's been ongoing since, since day one, since the system was, was designed or, or strengthened or redesigned um, starting in 2015. So uh, a lot of ongoing communication, um, regular meetings at each of the districts where we started our activities in, in, um, in the 11 districts um, 
particularly through the development of quality improvement teams, which really are data focused data review teams and, and building that, um, that culture of data use that really helped push forward this, the um, ability to introduce tools later, the, the digital tools later. So I think, you know, engendering and empowering the folks at the district level to, to use data on an ongoing basis for operations, but also for, for management supervision, for, for um, performance improvement kinds of, for system and performance improvement. I think that helped build that. So, you know, I can't say that there, it was a specific change management, um, you know, activity, but an ongoing one that um, has been going on since, since day one. Um, and I think those, those quality improvement teams, the data review teams is, was, is a very important part of that in engendering this culture of data use um, throughout the system. So. Alrighty, um, it looks like there are uh, two more questions in the chat. Um, they're, they're quite similar. So I'm gonna pose them together and you guys can then tackle it. Um, so uh, um, one of the questions is, um, will the tool be rolled out and scaled for other categories of products? And um, why contraceptives as a pilot? Um, actually, <laughs> BKKBM is the National Family Planning Board. Um, in Indonesia, it is a separate organization from Ministry of Health. And so this, we are, our, our client, our partner there is BKKBM. So that's why it's contraceptives. Um, so that's, that's where it started. Omar, do you want to say anything? Yeah, so I mean, because of the nature of our project, we don't really work with the other programs. Uh, and as Barbara mentioned, it's separate from the ministry. Uh, but having said that, uh, you know, these tools are pretty easily transferable to uh, to other programs if we need to in the future. Wonderful. I think uh, that was a great. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And you know, we'll move to the uh, final final presentation. Then we'll open it up to uh, a massive uh, Q&A. So thank you. Great. Hi there, everyone. My name is Adam Brain. I'm the Director of Product Management at Everyone Mobile. And uh, the presentation today is, is going to be talking about uh, the Nigeria program operating in Lagos, Nigeria, and specifically how the program has been working to strengthen private health providers. Um, to deliver high quality care to low income consumers during the COVID-19 pandemic. So just to provide some background and context as to where the program is working, um, the Niger program works predominantly with uh, informal medicine vendors or patent and proprietary medicine vendors referred to as PPMVs. PPMVs are the primary channel for health provision to low income communities in Lagos. Um, and they're often trusted individuals uh, that have been working for a long time within their communities. At the same time, they often encounter a number of barriers to providing quality health products and services to their customers. Uh, PPMVs often have limited access to business management skills, business networks and support services that enable them to manage and grow their businesses and improve their range of services. In addition to this, PPMVs often unknowingly sell counterfeit and un unregulated medicines, which can jeopardize consumer safety. Um, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, many of these issues have been exacerbated, with national lockdowns restricting the ability of consumers and PPMVs to conduct in-person transactions, um, in addition to shortages and availability of many basic hygiene products, such as basic soaps, disinfectants and hand sanitizers. In an attempt to respond to many of the, the issues experienced by uh, PPMVs and their customers uh, in the Nigerian health supply chain, um, Nigeria was established through a partnership with Unilever and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, in 2017. Um, and it comprises a successful digital community of, of 290 PPMVs, all of which are based in Lagos. Um, Nigeria is an interactive mobile website that offers a comprehensive package of digital content and interactive business tools. Um, and it aims to improve the efficiency and resilience of the Nigerian health supply chain um, through making uh, affordable and quality health products available in low income communities. 
the tools provided by NIGICARE, which I'll come on to in a moment, support PPMVs to strengthen the quality of essential primary healthcare services they provide to their communities, and as a result, strengthen the overall resilience of the health supply chain. So this slide sets out the NIGICARE model and the, and the various stakeholders in the supply chain that are involved and impacted by uh, NIGICARE project activities. I think that the key point to emphasize here is that NIGICARE has been conceptualized as a commercially sustainable model um, through partnership with uh, corporate suppliers of, of health products. Um, but just starting on the left hand side, I mean, the first uh, group obviously impacted by NIGICARE are the PPMVs themselves and the community um, pharmacists. And their real uh, benefits and uh, uh, reason to engage is uh, to improve access to, to digital skills and services that enable them to increase their business management capacity, um, as well as uh, increasing sales volumes and revenues as a result of digital services such as consumer loyalty and uh, e-vouchering services, which I'll explain shortly. Um, and there are also uh, supply chain services as well uh, through sort of stock ordering uh, facilities called the NIGICARE shop, which enables them to gain access to affordable, good quality um, products. On the consumer side, um, the uh, although consumers are not a direct um, audience of, of the NIGICARE site, um, many of the, the services that are provided to PPMVs um, indirectly positively impact the consumer themselves. Um, so as a result of, of NIGICARE, um, they gain access to uh, reliable accredited medicines and commodities through improved um, supply chain interactions from PPMVs. Um, they receive increased quality of care at the point of services through uh, health information. Um, they, uh, we've also been exploring a digitized referral service um, to uh, community pharmacists and other primary healthcare facilities uh, at the point of the PPMV, um, as well as discount vouchers um, for everyday uh, hygiene products um, that are sent directly to them via SMS. Um, and they also uh, gain increased confidence in an access to services like rapid diagnostic testing, which um, is also being uh, tested in, through the program at PPMVs. Um, from PCN's perspective, which is the Pharmacist Council of Nigeria, um, they receive a direct, scalable and sustainable access to an increasingly digitally literate network of PPMVs um, as a result of the program. Uh, they, they receive digitized and incentivized referral networks between PPMVs, community pharmacists and primary, primary healthcare providers. Um, there's also greater registration and compliance uh, by PPMVs nationally um, as a result of uh, NIGICARE activities. Um, and they also benefit from PPMVs themselves, increasing the quality of services uh, they provide to their consumers. And the main point I want to raise here is that um, the activities of the program are underpinned by uh, partnerships with uh, corporate uh, providers of, of healthcare products um, because the NIGICARE site um, also enables uh, a greater uh, sales volume and revenues for key health products um, through vouchering and online ordering facilities um, and also through providing analytics and data on consumer on, on consumption behaviors by PPMVs and consumers which are of value to corporate. So the, the revenue model here is is through um, a uh, selling selling these services to corporates. In terms of our activities to date, so the, the programme commenced in 2017 and the uh, first year of, of activity really focused on uh, definition and discovery. So de developing a, a really um, clear understanding of uh, PPMVs, uh, their, their roles and activities in uh, health supply chains, um, and also what the, the main barriers and constraints were they were facing um, for their day-to-day -day activities. So with that in mind, we um, we, we conducted human-centered design research with PPMVs in Lagos, um, as well as qualitative and, and ethnographic research to uh, make sure that all of those um, requirements uh, were developed into an engaging value proposition for the program, their customers and their stakeholders. Um, since then, we've been um, implementing pilots to, to really test this, this value proposition. So um, we 
designed and tested the first version of Niger Care um, from 2018 to 2019 um, and uh, tested that with 200 PPMPs in Lagos. Um, the first features and content focused on uh, predominantly on capacity building um, for business and financial management and healthcare through uh, the Niger Care Academy, which provides uh, eight formal e-learning courses. Um, mentoring and expert advice, uh, as well as business and customer care advice from fellow PPMVs through interactive forums. And the scale up and commercialization phase, which is where we're at at the moment, um, aims to uh, further strengthen the PPMV value proposition through experimenting with um, new, new models. Um, adapting to the changing stakeholder landscape and, and obviously much of the COVID-19 work we've been uh, conducting over the last few months really responds to that, um, as well as aligning with broader health system strengthening work. Um, and we're now starting to look ahead towards expanding the Niger Care user base um, as we move to scale up, but, but also at the same time as doing that, also expanding the, the range of corporate partners of, uh, working with the programme uh, beyond just uh, Unilever and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, so that we can finalise um, these commercial revenue streams. So there are three main service areas under Niger Care. Um, for PPMVs, uh, the first of which is the Niger Care Shop, which is essentially a, a digital um, ordering system that is available to PPMVs through the Niger Care site um, and supplies and delivers assured medicines from a, uh, a registered supplier of assured medicines within Lagos. Um, the main benefits here are uh, one, um, it obviously enables uh, access to affordable and quality assured uh, supplies for the shop. Um, it also includes a delivery component. So any products delivered through the service are delivered directly to the PPMV, uh, which is beneficial because it means they don't lose time um, having to shut their shop and, and go and visit suppliers to, to purchase stock. Um, and then also more broadly, there's, there's obviously a benefit to the supply chain um, as this this linkage um, substitutes out counterfeit products um, that may well have been sourced from from other um, other suppliers outside of, of Niger Care. So the the second area of support is around the Niger Care Academy and an online content and community management that's provided through the site. Um, and this this comprises predominantly business and health focused e learning courses, um, which enables PPMVs to, to access practical business skills and up-to-date COVID-19 information during the pandemic. Um, and it enables them to do that through a sort of structured learning experience. So one of the, the things that we discovered uh, during the research phase of the, the project is that PPMVs are, are obviously predominantly business people and, and by that nature are, are, very, business, are very busy. Um, so they're constantly having to sort of stop and start depending on when customers visit and, and obviously prioritise uh, sales in that type of environment. So with that in mind, we've actually designed our e-learning courses so that they are structured into chapters and you can kind of uh, take or complete a chapter um, in a, when you have a sort of spare five or ten minutes put your, you know, and, and stop um, as and when needed and then resume at a point in the future. Um, so that's generally how we've designed our, our learning experience. Um, and I think it's also worth pointing out that as well as sort of providing uh, these no this knowledge and skills uh, directly to the PPMVs, um, they're also encouraged to sort of share and, and engage with this content with their consumers as well so that they can share more widely uh, the benefits of, um, of the academy. And then the, the final area is around uh, consumer discounts, which uh, we've, we've launched in the last six months on Niger Care. Um, and this is uh, essentially a, a, a discount voucher service whereby we can send uh, discount vouchers directly to consumers at PPMV shops, um, uh, you know, receivable on their mobile phone. Um, and the advantage of that is, is that um, from the PPMV's perspective, it's obviously uh, encouraging greater footfall through their shops through uh, through discounts um, and from the uh, from the consumer's perspective it's actually lowering the cost of, of everyday products that they were already purchasing um, and through throughout the COVID-19 pandemic we've been uh, focusing these discounts on basic hygiene products to to lower the cost to the consumer themselves and obviously encourage greater uptake of those products at the current time. 
and then quickly on on some of the the early stage impact we've seen um, to date. So so on the shop we've seen um, we've seen good uptake um, since launching um, at the end of last year with over 390 orders placed through the NigerCare shop so far. And that translates into um, nearly 5 million Naira's worth of assured medicines entering the supply chain um, directly through that channel. On the uh, academy front, we've um, launched eight live e-learning courses since the program began um, that focus predominantly on primary healthcare delivery and business skills. And really encouragingly, we've we've seen a very high completion rates with 85% completing on business management courses and on a recent family planning course, that figure actually rose to 90%. On the consumer discounts side of things, um, as I mentioned, we've, we've only recently launched um, in August of this year. Um, but again, the early stage results have been encouraging. Um, you know, with a small subset of, of only 20 PPMVs while we've been testing the, the service, we've, we've so far seen um, 500 uh, consumer vouchers redeemed, um, and that translates into so far 50,000 Naira's worth of, of savings made by uh, low-income consumers in Lagos. So moving on to uh, COVID-19 uh, specifically, um, the first area that we've been working uh, since March has been to really try and position Niger Care um, as a as a source of you know reliable and good quality health information for for PPMVs, um, and you can see that we've you know from these screens that we've uh, included sort of basic facts and figures around what global cases are. Um, what case rates are in Nigeria, as well as um, trying to, you know, provide information and encourage our PPMVs to to take part in, you know, good hygiene behaviours, washing your hands, maintaining social distancing, and avoiding touching your eyes, nose, and mouth, etc. Um, so uh, the first area in which we've intervened is, has been trying to sort of get engagement from PPMVs um, on on this content um, and encourage in, in sort of participation on. To so in relation to the Niger Care shop, uh, one of the first things we did under the pandemic was to create a coronavirus safety uh, section of the Niger Care shop to ensure PPMVs could quickly find and source essential items demanded by customers. Um, and the, the second area that we worked was to essentially uh, purchase through the uh, Niger Care shop supplier uh, COVID-19 hygiene product bundles. So that included uh, hand sanitizers and um, personal protective equipment, um, which PPMVs themselves could use in their shops um, when customers were attending to try and obviously uh, reduce the risk of, of transmission um, to, to customers. So we launched the consumer discounts service under Niger Care in August of this year, um, which functions by distributing uh, vouchers directly to consumers at PPMV shops via SMS uh, once per week. Um, and these vouchers enable consumers to um, receive a discount of between, on average, 15 to 20 percent on their on purchases of everyday products um, when it's presented to the PPMV. Um, and the PPMV can can then redeem it on their behalf through the Niger Care site. Um, so since launching in August, we've uh, focused the um, product eligibility under the scheme to products that that obviously support good hygiene practices and and uh, good COVID nineteen behavioural practices. So um, we've been offering discounts on predominantly soaps, disinfectants, etc., to to really kind of improve. Um, good hygiene and, and hopefully minimise transmission wherever possible by PPMVs and consumers in their communities. So on to the, the lessons that we've seen from, from implementing under the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I think the, the, the sort of key, key trend that we've seen throughout that period has been a, a huge growth in the level of digital activity that we've seen from our, our user base. Um, which is, is no surprise given um, the restrictions that we've seen under the pandemic um, happening globally. Um, and I, I think this is you know, obviously important to highlight because it suggests that where there are any opportunities to, to digitize um, activities that were uh, previously not done through digital channels, 
that is translating into um, engagement from, from users. At the same time, we've seen that um, that growth in, in digital activity uh, needs to be accompanied by a very clear value proposition um, that is, is very much grounded in, in solving everyday problems for, for PPMVs. Um, and so this slide talks to um, you know, some of the, the feedback we've, we've experienced from our users around the Niger Care shop and, and particularly the supply of, of, of products since March. Um, and you can see that uh, you know, a lot of the qualitative um, feedback we're seeing is that um, users are saying that it's sort of clear, they, un they can see what the benefits are very clearly to them around uh, convenience and having the products delivered directly to them. Um, and also, you know, they're not having to cover costs like transport fares or, or closing their shops to actually go and collect products. Um, and the other piece as well in the case of the shop is that there's um, uh, the actual assurance that PPMVs are, are, are sourcing quality products is, is a benefit not just to them, but also something that they can make their customers aware of, um, which, which is also very encouraging to see. And then more on the quantitative side as well, you can see that um, figures from, from the first part of this year throughout the pandemic, in terms of order volumes, total sales, and, and average order value seen through the shop, we, we saw significant increases from our, from our user base. Um, just because you know digital channels enable them to to continue sourcing stock when when other um, uh, other real life channels um, that they would normally use were, were no longer available. And then the the final sort of takeaway from the, ex the experience we've had working with PPMVs um, is that we've seen that that actually if we're if we're trying to look at improving PPMV resilience. Um, a lot of the feedback that we're getting from PPMVs is that um, solving sort of one constraint that they might face, for example, working capital, although valuable, is, is often not enough. Um, and that actually interventions to sort of support their activities need to be joined up and working to address multiple constraints. And really, that's how we've we've tried to position Niger Care and, and why we're actually working in such a broad range of areas with PPMVs is because we're trying to position ourselves to be sort of the kind of one-stop shop where a trusted source that they can go to um, regardless of the problems they're experiencing, you know, whether they need to um, access reliable information on emerging trends under the COVID-19 pandemic or, or whether they need to be able to, to order and source um, a, a product that, that's safe um, and, and assured for their customers. Um, they can come to one, one place um, and conduct that digitally and, and instantly. And so that, that concludes the presentation today. Thanks everyone for, for attending and listening and um, look forward to, to receiving any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Alrighty, so we are open to questions. Um, I believe uh, Adam is on the call as well. So any questions, um, he will uh, he can unmute himself and um, respond. Um, Adam, if you had anything else you also wanted to add or say uh, talk about even more, so um, you do have the time to do so. Yeah, thanks for that, Mohit. I don't think I have anything else to add at this stage. Um, but thank you. It looks like we have one question, uh, Adam, uh, regarding does Najee Care uh, do, does about Najee Care does the business model subscription uh, based on high margin products? Is it based off of off of uh, on high margin products? Um, I think Bobby was asking this. Sure. So, um, generally speaking, we it's it's everyday fast moving consumer goods. So it's it's not focused on on high margin products, but um, as I say, uh, products that uh, we'd see uh, consumers coming in and buying, not necessarily on a daily basis, but a few times per week. So typically low margin, fast moving consumer goods. So I guess we have a few other questions, Adam. Um, Bridget was asking, do you have any data on the business impact? to traditional suppliers as PPMV shift their procurement to Najee shops? Yes, yeah, good question. Um, we don't, we haven't actually got as far as, as looking at looking at the data around uh, displacement with, within the supply chain um, and the impact on um, more traditional suppliers. But it, it's a really good question because um, of course we want to make sure, although we're uh, the Niger Care shop supplier is um, 
providing assured medicines, um, there's definitely further work that needs to be done to make sure that we're not displacing other traditional suppliers um, and, and actually crowding them out of the market. We do have uh, another question. Barbara was asking, um, do the e-learning courses for PPMVs include supply chain training, like uh, record keeping, proper storage of medicines and other things? Yeah, it's a real uh, combination. So, um, uh, I mean, uh, under the sort of business management skills things, we've, we've got a course that's uh, on understanding credit and we've also got a course on record keeping. Um, so it's kind of a, a broad range, um, but largely sort of practical skills that, that also, you know, that they would use on a day to day basis. Um, and then on the, you know, in terms of more of a health focus, um, uh, we don't have one at the moment on, on proper storage of medicines, but it is a, a really good suggestion. Um, typically today, it's um, been looking at areas such as uh, family planning, um, information and advice to consumers. Um, but we're, we're obviously looking to, to kind of broaden that and make it as relevant as possible, given the, the current COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you all for attending. And uh, we will be looking forward to seeing you guys at the uh, air meet session. Thank you.